All right, we'll give people a minute or two to enter the room. All right, as people are trickling in, I realize it's one minute after 1130. So welcome to the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. This is the first week of school at Stanford and we're excited to be back, albeit under very different circumstances than usual. Um, it was six months ago to the day that the Bay Area was the first place in the nation to issue shelter in place orders. They went into effect at midnight on March 17th. And it's been a very eventful six months since then for anyone who's interested in either democracy or development. So we really appreciate your taking the time to join us today. We hope that you and all of your loved ones have managed to stay safe. And we'll be here every Thursday until Thanksgiving at 1130. You can check out the lineup of fantastic speakers on our website and also stay in touch on social media. So today we will be kicking off our seminars with an excellent panel to discuss American democracy and the 2020 elections. Let me introduce the panelists briefly before handing over the floor to them. If you have any questions, please chat them to me in the Q&A and we will leave hopefully ample time for a discussion at the end. So to start, Julia Azari is the Associate Professor and Assistant Chair in the Department of Political Science at Marquette University. She's a regular contributor to 538.com and the author of Delivering the People's Message, The Changing Politics of the Presidential Mandate. And she's currently working on a book about weak parties and strong partisanship. Ted Johnson is next. He's a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. And before joining the Brennan Center was a career military officer and a White House fellow. He is the author of a forthcoming book called When the Stars Begin to Fall about how national solidarity can help overcome the effects of racism. And finally, David Brady is the Davies Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, as well as the Bowen H. and Janice Arthur McCoy Professor of Political Science and Ethics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's a scholar of congressional and electoral politics and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1987. So thank you again to all of our panelists for being here and to you, the audience, and we will go ahead and begin with Professor Azari, Julia. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Didi. I am going to kind of frame my remarks around some big things I'm looking at in the as we head toward the, the 2020 elections. The overarching question for me during the Trump years has been the combination of the normal and the abnormal. And so the question that keeps going around in my mind is what political forces will operate as if there were not a pandemic? There were not an incumbent president talking about serving three terms or refusing the election results. What if there were not an unprecedented economic collapse? What areas of political life, on the other hand, might defy prediction and regularity? I think it was these dynamics that really drove the 2016 race. And what underlies some of these thoughts is how the 2020 um, results in the remaining time in the election might resemble and also differ from what we saw in 2016. A big question that stems out of that is what the Republican Party will look like leading up to the election and, and will some of the efforts of people like the Lincoln Project matter. In 2016, we saw a similar kind of dynamic where um, numerous kind of elite institutions, including many never Trump Republicans in prominent positions, especially in around the sort of intellectual project of, um, of conservatism and also the national security apparatus really did, I think, break away from Trump, but ultimately it really didn't seem to matter among the electorate. And so I, I'm wondering if those dynamics will be different this year and if there will be a more evident anti-Trump faction within the Republican electorate and how that, of course, would shape the results. Moving in a somewhat different direction, I'm also curious about what administration will look like. And by curious, I think I mean very concerned. Um, Election administration combines a very standard feature of American democracy, the very decentralized and federal structure of election rules with, um, with these dramatically unique circumstances of the pandemic. So ultimately we have some, these kinds of underlying resources and values that inform the way in which people are able to request absentee ballots, to vote by mail or other alternative formats. Um, we have a, 
you know, that really, these sort of underlying things that will shape what can happen in 2020 when people may have totally different reasons for, um, for voting by mail. So I wonder, you know, what will happen in states to make this easier or harder as we hit the home stretch? Um, will these efforts be mobilizing or will they be demobilizing? And ultimately, will there be disputes in the authority over who counts the ballots? The final question that, that I have is whether the election will be about the economy or about something else. So there's, there's a substantial body of research that suggests that American presidential elections might simply be a matter of retrospective voting, a, a referendum on the status quo. But it's not clear to me that either campaign has, has really framed the election that way, even though the economy is in such an exceptional state. There's also research that suggests that, that campaigns and elite rhetoric do have an impact on whether voters look to the economy as a way to, to make their choice or look, look elsewhere. Um, and, and politics Twitter has been really embroiled in these, in these battles about how much the economy matters. The GDP losses using existing models would predict a historic loss for Trump. Um, and in 2016, the candidates mattered a lot less than these fundamentals. The, the, election, the economy and the state of the, the country really predicted a close election, which is what we saw. Um, we would expect that the incumbent party, the Republicans, would de-emphasize the economy. Um, and we've kind of seen some of that, a lot of emphasis on cultural issues and also some emphasis on the economy pre-COVID, trying, um, trying to kind of recast this economic retrospective voting as you know, judges by before this thing happened that we couldn't control. The Democrats, I think really strikingly at the Democratic National Convention, focused not just on the economy, but on the constitution and the state of American democracy. And I think that, for example, former President Barack Obama's speech was a kind of signature moment at that event of you know, talking about the stakes of the election as being so much more. And there's a tension here because I think the economy is really important, obviously, to people's lives um, and is the most immediate factor. But at the same time, the country's issues seem so much bigger and so much weightier than any one economy or any one economic measure. Um, and it's, it's hard, I think, to tell what exactly the right message would be. But what we'll find out in November is whether democracy, inequality, and the values underlying the incumbent administration make for a winning message. Thanks so much, Julia. All right, next up, Ted, please. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for, for having me here and, for, um, and, and to the panelists for, for this discussion. I'm <laughs> looking forward to it. So I, what I wanna do is talk um, a, a little bit about race and this election, especially from the perspective of black voters or, or black Americans. So look, I think this election is going to, it's an opportunity for us to take the temperature of the state of our democracy. Um, we, I think this is something the Biden campaign has, a point they've hammered home that this is, you know, a battle for the soul of America. On the trump Pence side, they've talked about, you know, if you, the country, you will not recognize your country unless we are, we are reelected. Um, and so what I like to do, or, you know, based on my, my expertise is to look at symptoms of what might be ailing our democracy. And I look at black voting behavior as a symptom of a problem in our democracy. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns about what's going to happen in November, but one thing we can almost be certain of is that the Biden-Harris ticket is going to get about eight times as many black voters supporting them as Trump will. And this is about the, the mean uh, difference between Democrats and Republicans going back to, to 1964. In 2016, 17.1 black Americans voted in the election and nearly 16 million of them voted against Donald Trump. And again, this is a behavior we've seen for about four or five decades for the Democratic side. But more importantly, this is behavior we've seen for the last 150 years, um, really 153 years um, since before the 15th Amendment, when some of the former slaveholding states were trying to work their way back into the Union. And there were freedmen who were voting then to, to help these states gain reentry. What we've seen are Black Americans, to the extent they could vote, 
voting in overwhelming fashion for the same party. And they, it wasn't because that party necessarily aligned to every one of their political interests or preferences, but it's because black voters were organized against the party that was willing to embrace white segregationists um, or today voting against the party they perceive to be less willing to, to enforce civil rights protections across a range of issues and to address some of the effects of structural racism across a number of socioeconomic factors. So, um, a lot of energy, a lot of scholarship, including my own, is focused on explaining why it is Black voters have behaved this way for so long and what explains that behavior today. Uh, some of the prevailing theories are uh, Michael Dawson's Black Utility Heuristic, which suggests that uh, Black Americans, especially low information uh, Black Americans, and frankly, most Americans are low info, uh, but if you're, if you're Black and low info, that the best way to determine who, which candidate to support or which party to support is to get a sense of which one, not which one would be better for you personally, but which one would be better for the group, which, which party, which candidate would be better for Black America, and then voting in, in, uh, for, for that candidate and putting your personal interests, sort of subjugating that to the group interest. Um, another theory out from, uh, from Frimer out of Princeton is about electoral capture, which suggests that, that there's a party that is acceptable to a group and a party that is unacceptable, and that group is now effectively captured in the acceptable party because there's no alternative in a two-party system of democracy if you, you either go with the, the least the lesser of two evils or not at all. Um, and so uh, th this is also used to describe why, why Black voting has been so uniform for, for decades and, and in fact over a century. Uh, and then a newer idea out of, um, from Ismail White and Cheryl Laird uh, in their new book, Steadfast Democrats, suggests that uh, black voters are actually socially pressured to support Democrats because that is a way of signaling solidarity with the group. And if you don't signal that solidarity, you face ostracization or social penalties by the group by not uh, putting that group interest ahead of your own. Because um, as we know, if, if race is a primary uh, social determinant for, for Black Americans, then if you vote against a group, you're essentially voting to undermine the, the very thing that uh, impacts your life outcomes, your life chances the most. So what I believe all this behavior tells us is that um, for a group this large, 12, 13% of the population, since the moment they've been given the right to vote, have almost always, with the exception of maybe four or five presidential elections, voted in overwhelming fashion for one party or the other, uh, that signals that our two-party system of democracy is um, subject to uh, exploitation by faction. And this is what um, is talked about in Federalist Paper 10, that faction can and perhaps will be the downfall of democracy unless kept in check. The solution put forward in Fellows Paper 10 was uh, this is a lesser concern because we have a large republic which will keep these factions at bay and we have good honorable men representing the country who will put the country first and not their own interests and these things will sort of um, modulate whatever uh, detrimental impacts faction will have and uh, my uh, uh, you know, the, the way I see it is that the presence of the black monolith in the voting booth on presidential and congressional election days is a sign that faction has not subsided, that, that our large republic and faith in honorable elected officials is not a sufficient protection against some of the ills in our democracy, especially when it comes to the role of race relations in the history of our country uh, that, that our nation has with, um, with, uh, with race generally, not just with uh, pertaining to, to Black Americans. So for this presidential election, um, I won't be looking so much at how Black people vote. I, I think it's, uh, you know, Joe Biden on a good day is going to get 90%, and on a better day will get 92, and on a bad day, maybe 87, 88. But it's going to be about there. The bigger question is about turnout. And this has always been the question. Jim Crow laws and codes, they were about many things, but voter disenfranchisement was one of them. Felony disenfranchisement was another. There have been many ways that this nation has tried to shape the electorate in order to bake in advantages for one party or another. And I think uh, what we will see this November will give us a sense um, about the links to which our current form of government is willing to go 
to disenfranchise uh, certain voters in order to hold on power or the links they're willing to go to enfranchise voters in order to uh, gain an electoral advantage. So um, it's sort of wrapping up here. I think what we'll see uh, in November is uh, what we should pay attention to is voter suppression, uh, particularly things like not just voter ID laws or voter purges, but how will the access to the ballot be shaped by COVID-19 and state and local responses to that. Uh, we saw in the Kentucky primary where all the polling stations around Louisville, Kentucky were closed except for one and all of the folks in, in the area had to vote at this one place and naturally everyone didn't get there on time. People were banging on windows and doors and the rationale for doing this, for closing polling stations around the area and having it in this one place was because of poll workers who did not want to be subjected to COVID-19, because of concerns about the um, safety of not just poll workers, but voters congregating in, in a number of different places. So what types of voter suppression will be masked by COVID response measures? Um, how will mail-in voting either be accepted in some states and not accepted in others shape, the, shape turnout, uh, which will also shape, uh, and especially in battleground states, um, potentially the outcome of you know who gets those electoral college votes and how will things like um, felony reenfranchisement efforts in places like Florida that are being uh, that the people support that the state government has stonewalled and things like wait times and the availability of polling stations affect turnout and I think that is something uh, a signal we will see uh, from the black experience in November that will give us a sense of uh, the government, local, state, and federal responses to, uh, to turnout, either trying to enable it or, or complicate it. And that will give us a sense of exactly what sort of democracy we're dealing with um, in, in the, the, the months ahead. All right, thank you so much for that, Ted. Um, David is going to present next, but we are going to share my screen. So, one sec. Okay, first slide. <clears throat> Um, okay, so what I want to do is I want to start out with uh, on uh, the first date you see on that screen is uh, March the 29th, 31st. That was the period where President Trump had started to treat uh, coronavirus seriously. And at that point, that table one, sorry, back one up. Uh, two, one. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. So you see on that uh, by Republicans and Democrats, and I include moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats because research shows that uh, of, uh, when, the, when, when uh, the votes that Trump got last time from uh, Hillary Clinton and the votes she got vice versa tend out to be the uh, wings in their party that are furthest away from the conservatives and the liberals. So that's moderates in both parties. But, but the point to note is that at this point, uh, in March, he was doing very well. But by September uh, 10th, and this is the uh, last uh, first poll, after, this is the first YouGov economist poll after uh, Labor Day. And you can see that uh, he's lost uh, points in the confidence on, on both overall confidence among Republicans. He's lost it among Democrats, but the most important point is he's lost it among moderate Republicans and uh, moderate Democrats and independence. So across the board, the coronavirus has hurt, uh, has hurt the president. Uh, number two, sorry. Second side, and so if you look at the gain or loss by party and in independence from March to September, so you can see that the Republican, Republicans voting for Trump in uh, March at the point where all the betting polls said he's gonna be reelected. He's down five points from that, so he's gone from 91 to only 86% of Republicans support him. Democrats voting for Biden has gone from 84 to 90, which is a plus six, another uh, bonus. And I just got the most recent YouGov poll. I looked at it and he's up another two points. So he's up to 92 now. And on the pure independent vote for Biden, Biden's up 12 points there. So uh, this is, uh, all this has helped Biden. Third slide. So if we look by uh, vote uh, for Biden by Trump handling of COVID, March to September. So if you just ask uh, the percent of Republicans who disapproved of Trump handling of COVID was 7% March and it's 16% now. And of those Republicans who disapprove of Trump, note that it's gone from 28% in March saying they would vote against him to vote for Biden and now it's 48. So that's a 20% jump to Biden. 
And now the percent of independents who uh, disapproved of Hunt and Trump's uh, handling has gone from 43 to 45 to two. But if you disapprove of Trump's handling, it's gone from 49 to 56. So the COVID, uh, next slide please. So COVID is an issue that has surely hurt him. Now, uh, I don't have a lot of time. So the second issue I wanted to deal with Everybody I know, and I spend a lot of time talking to people about elections, uh, Didi among them, they worried about this uh, issue of the protest and how that's cutting. So this is uh, the percent who believe the protests are mainly violent versus peaceful. They have to choose whether the protest is peaceful or violent. So you can see that in all states, Democrats, 15% uh, say they're mainly peaceful. Republicans are at 71 uh, percent that that the protests are mainly violent and independents are in between. But no, in the battleground states, the 11 battleground states, uh, the number of Democrats who perceive it as uh, violent is higher. The number of Republicans who perceive it as higher and the same with independents. And, and the percent uh, those uh, who buy, vo voting for Trump for president is also uh, higher. So a number of Democrats, et cetera. So bottom line is that that is an issue. So if you look at Republicans there, in all states, 90% of Republicans say they're gonna vote for Trump, but in battleground states, it's 96%. And among independents, if you think the protests are mainly violent, then it's 80%. So that is a little worrying. Uh, we have, uh, we are with CBS going around and doing uh, new polls. We pick two or three at a time. And when we do those two or three at a time, we still have uh, Biden up by four points in Florida, though there's another new poll uh, coming up in Florida that I'll talk to you a little bit about in a minute. Uh, he's still up by five in Pennsylvania. So we are seeing, uh, saw a little bit of movement but not a great deal of movement. Next, next slide. So it, it, in my view, it's still about coronavirus. <clears throat> now, this is uh, my slide uh, to Bernie Sanders. And uh, Bernie Sanders, as you may have noted in the papers, has been saying Trump needs, I'm not Trump, but Biden needs to move to the left. So here we have self-classified, very liberal Democrats. People say I'm either very liberal, I'm liberal, or I'm moderate to conservative. Those numbers are about 38, 40% say they're moderate, and 30, 28% are very liberal, 32% say they're liberal. But no, and it didn't matter. So if you look at uh, the, how they're gonna vote, Biden 96, 95 in September, vote Trump, nobody. And among liberals, three or four percent are about. But the place where uh, Joe Biden can lose votes is among the moderates and the conservatives. So my view of this is a table that says, hey, Joe Biden doesn't need to move to the left. He needs to stay where he is or move to the center. And if you know, um, even among moderates, they, it has, it's not too bad for Biden because even among moderates, he's picked up a little bit and the number of others won't vote and don't know has declined from 10 to four. So uh, I think that, uh, I think Biden's managing the campaign uh, pretty pretty well so far, and but this is an issue that's tied to the previous issue, which is has to do with protests. Next slide, sorry. Uh, and this is uh, just a quick look at the four gaps in American politics, and the four gaps are race, age, education, and uh, gender. And so I what I have here is. Uh, I compare where Hillary Clinton was in 2016 with where Joe Biden is on the exact same week. And you'll know across the board on white, on race, uh, Biden's doing much better. Among females, he's doing better. Among men, he's doing better. Uh, college, he's doing better. Non-college, he's a little bit down. But uh, essentially, he's doing much better. The two areas that are uh, look problematic are, number one, he's... Uh, he's at 64.5% uh, in, in, on the race variable. Now that's broken down by uh, African-American, uh, Hispanic, and other. And uh, the, his, the black vote is, is uh, more for Biden at this point. He's at 85%, where Hillary was at about 80%. 
the drop off that brings that down to 64.5 is that we're, we're getting in these polls about 30%, 31, 32% you know, Hispanic voters saying that they are voting for Trump. Um, that's a little problematic in these samples of 1,200 people. So we are uh, going back in. So there's a wide variety of Hispanic voting. So this could be overrepresenting Florida in this particular sample. I believe there's some indication that it is. But we are now going in, uh, increasing the Hispanic, uh, his Hispanic parts of the sample in all those big states when we move to uh, from 1,000 to 4,000. So in two weeks, uh, we should have the answer, is that a real movement or is it in fact, will it, will it slide back when we get better sampling? Uh, sorry, next slide. And this is the gap, uh, four gap, uh, now there are three gaps. Uh, this is the gaps among uh, white people. And again, it compares Hillary Clinton in 2016 to uh, Joe Biden in 2020. And you can see that uh, Biden is up 10, uh, 10 points among women, white women. He's up uh, 12, 13, almost 13 points among white men. And he's up among college and non-college. And uh, he's up in, across every age uh, group, uh, even seniors, he's up from where she was. So all of that uh, sends a good story uh, for Biden. He appears to be doing well. And when you look at the compared to the uh, battleground states like uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Minnesota, those states uh, tend to be more white, less, uh, less diverse. And so the results is this table also uh, looks pretty good for uh, Biden. Next slide, sorry. Uh, okay, now this, this is a very interesting one because we, we, uh, we, uh, we the YouGov, was not off very much. We predicted that Hillary, Hillary Clinton would win with 2.6, uh, would, would win by 2.6 percent. That was pretty correct. We got a state or two wrong, as you know, it didn't, didn't work out. But the point on this one is, so in order to check that we're not, that we haven't made a bad sampling error, we have actually a panel of uh, people who we know how they voted in 2016. I actually went out and saw that they voted, checked how they voted. And so the result is, I, comparing the 2016 vote with the 2020 vote, know that uh, Biden is getting 93.5% of the vote that Clinton got, plus uh, only 3.5% of that vote are going to uh, Trump. Whereas, no, Trump is only getting 87.2% of the vote he got, and, and uh, Biden's getting 4.8% of that. And if you actually break that down further, it's the moderate Republicans who are over there. And you can see that the vote in 2016 that went for Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, that vote is overwhelmingly going to uh, Joe Biden. So at this point, uh, everything appears stable to me. The Trump bump that he got after the, uh, the Republican convention, uh, that seems to have disappeared. In our re most recent poll, he's uh, Biden's up over 9% again, and it appears to be reasonably stable. And the last slide. All right, now I'll give you something to worry about. So the uh, elect, so in, in what you have to worry about in, in the electoral college is that if there is a, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. If in the electoral college, what you have to worry about is, it, is there a second set of ballots submitted for the state electors? And the date is December 14th. And so there's some question about, well, can all the votes be counted uh, by that time, et cetera. And so I, I, I'm not going to go with that, but I am going to show you this. If you look at this is uh, Democrats, and I include leaners, and that's uh, just the thing, Democrats and people who say they lean Democrat. Note that of Democrats, 54% uh, say they're gonna vote by mail. And of Republicans, you may know that only 26% are gonna vote by mail. And again, among independents, only 29% are going to vote uh, by mail. Now, what that means is that there is a phenomenon called the blue drift and that blue drift phenomena shows you that post 1 a.m 2 a.m on election night the votes overwhelmingly turn democratic that's been true for some time ed foley at ohio state has a great book on this and so what people worry about is 
as it starts to turn like that, what will Trump say? It's vote fraud, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing that could happen is you could have uh, the votes not counted as you approach the deadline for appointing electors. And some people worry that a governor might say, okay, I'm picking the electors. And no, and another set says, we're picking the electors this way. And as long as a state only submits one set of electors, that's the one they have to, the House and the Senate have to count that under an 1887 agreement. The difficulty would come at such point as a state submits two sets of electors. And in that case, uh, you need to talk to people who know a lot more about the law than I do. Thank you. All right, thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists for those um, concerning remarks but with relayed without a sense of panic. So we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, I'll go ahead and just start with one. Can the US be able to promote its model of democracy outside the United States, elsewhere in the world, when we are ourselves so shaken by deep divisions, partisanship, and election interference? Christopher Ray was testifying in front of Congress today from foreign powers. Perhaps we could just take all of those in turn, or any of you who have a response can go ahead and weigh in. Harder than it used to be. Harder than it used to be. I mean, I think the U.S. has a kind of a history of this, right? This is also the story of of the United States and democracy promotion after World War II, um, where we similarly had a lot of problems with civil rights here at home, and a lot of historians have written very, very compellingly about this problem. Um, and so it's hard, I think it's hard to actually say that there will definitely be a rational one-to-one -one fit between what our, um, what our promotion ideas are and what's going on here at home. And some people even argue there is a reverse kind of um, causality where the, the need to promote those ideas um, prompted people to improve things here. That would be a more positive story, but I think it'll be a challenge. And also it's, it's a partisan, how we relate to the rest of the world is a partisan issue in a way that it it was less so in the, you know, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. So that's that's another consideration. Yeah, that's I um, thank you, uh, audience member, for that wonderful question. Yeah, and I I think uh, two quick things. One is, um, if the results are disputed, I think the lesson we could have for the world is how well or not we resolve that dispute. Um, no matter what you think about the outcome of 2000 that both candidates were willing to abide by the ruling of the Supreme Court is a lesson in a functioning democracy. Um, even if you know, the electoral college isn't optimal, even if the ballot counting in Florida wasn't optimal, that both sides agreed to the rules and then adhered to the judgment is a good sign of a, of a, is a, good, is a, is a, sign of a good democracy. Um, I, if that happens this time around, I don't, we will, it remains to be seen whether or not the resolution will be as, uh, as you know, quote unquote, clean as it was in 2000. The, the other thing is um, the, around the American civil religion. You know, this is a, an idea from sociologist Robert Bella back in the 60s. And he, he at the end of this, the seminal article about the civil religion, that there's a sort of a, a quasi-religious way to be American or to practice civic pride. He says that the nation has faced three times of trial. The first time was during the Revolutionary War. Uh, the second time was on the issue of slavery. And he uh, surmised in 67 that we are now on in our third time of trial, whether or not we have a democracy that can be exported to the world. And if it fails here, the lesson would be that maybe it isn't possible to build a large multiracial egalitarian democracy or democratic republic. Um, and, uh, and, and this is the time of trial we are now in. And so I think the lesson we have for the, I think the world is watching us. And I think we are also taking cues from what's happening around the world. But the lesson we have for the world, I think will hinge largely on what the outcome of this coming election and then how the democratic institutions and players respond. Okay, we have a question from Leah Rosenzweig, who's one of our postdocs at CDDRL. Ted mentioned Ismail White's research on social pressure Black Americans face to vote for Democrats. She's curious what he, what you and the other panelists think about how social pressure to vote this year, so turnout questions, might be different in the context of COVID. Like maybe you'll see fewer of your neighbors at the polls or fewer I voted stickers in the office afterwards. 
Um, so will social pressure to turn out be weaker because of the pandemic and given how challenging it is to monitor other people's vote by mail? And also, David, I guess as a segue, all of your polling indicates that Biden is doing really well, but are you asking only likely voters, do those number change, numbers change when it comes to voters who face a lot more costs or challenges to getting to the polls? We, uh, we do try to take that into account. That is uh, partly, it's certainly the art uh, of, uh, of uh, polling in, in the sense that uh, we, we can pretty well tell how you would vote. The real question is, do, do we know that you're going to vote? This time uh, when we at so none of that data I presented was uh, enthusiastic voters. These were all registered voters, which uh, appears to be a little bit better indicator. But every time you look, go to the likely voter, who's people who are enthusiastic, uh, the Biden group goes up by about three or the Biden vote goes up, his lead goes up by three or four points. So the enthusiastic voters this time appear to benefit the Democrats. But I'm not. Uh, but I don't count on that in in any prediction I make because it's it's guesswork. Yeah. So I think um, I, I can't remember the papers that I've read on this, but I think social media is going to play an outsized role in this election, and when it comes to social pressure to turn out, uh, people. I remember research that shows that. Uh, people seeing I voted stickers in their Facebook feeds or social media feeds um, mobilizes them to also participate. So, the, so I think it's still possible uh, for turnout to be inspired or to, for people to be pressured socially to turn out based on visuals of other people posting that they had gone and voted. Um, I also think for black voters in particular and maybe Asian American voters, um, uh, that Kamala Harris being on the ticket and the chance to make history may also be a sort of social pressure that will um, get people off the sidelines and to the polls at, at, and, and uh, more willing to sort of like scale the walls put in front of them through COVID or some of the complications in accessing the ballot than, than maybe in another year. I, I w did want to add one thing that, you know, Trump, uh, Trump turns out to vote both for his base and the others. The 2018 off-year election generated the highest turnout in an off-year election in over 100 years. And so if we didn't have COVID, I would say turnout w was going to be very high. And the trouble with COVID is we, we don't know. But if, if, I had a, if I had to make a guess, I, say, I would say that turnout will be up. Okay. I want to weigh in from, yeah, from, here from uh, Swing State America, um, where, you know, so I live in Wisconsin, and in, um, in April, not, you know, just a few weeks into the pandemic, we had an election that was a presidential primary and also a Supreme Court election, and a presidential primary at the point when the race had largely been decided, and we had high turnout, um, even though mail-in voting was a mess, polling places were closed. Um, the rules had been changed back and forth by various state institutions at different points. I mean, it was just, you couldn't have manufactured a more confusing and worse mess um, of pandemic voting and still voter turnout was high because people saw the stakes of that Supreme Court, um, that Supreme Court seat as being important. And this is sort of what I was, I was trying to get out of my, um, in my remarks and I didn't say a whole lot about it, but there is evidence, I think, that um, that trying to disenfranchise people actually mobilizes them, and that's one of the that's one of the interesting kind of phenomena that I see here. Is this? There's not just this perception that voting is is dangerous, um, but also this perception that some people are trying to keep you from voting. Right? That's clearly a message that is floating out in the world, and I think that is mobilizing too. Um, to people, and I want to I want to conclude by probably turning in my political science card by talking about yard signs. But I think this is in the absence of something, um, in in the absence of something like I voted stickers or personal social interactions that are really limited right now. I do think that yard signs sort of function as people trying to to socially demonstrate what they're doing and potentially pressure their neighbors the same way. Um, and it is a, a real yard sign bonanza 
um, in the places I've been in, in Wisconsin, um, much more, I'm in Milwaukee, which is pretty democratic, so much more Biden than Trump, but I haven't ever really seen anything like it, including some hand-lettered signs. So I guess people are also getting really creative in the pandemic. But I do think that these are, these are some of the ways that people display social pressure under these conditions. And I think that the underlying features of that social pressure and the underlying ideas about what mobilizes people to go to the polls, I think those haven't changed. Um, another question here from Jamie O'Connell, who's an affiliate of CDDRL. Could, could all of you maybe talk about two factors that were sort of new in 2016 and that have potentially worsened since then, all of which you've mentioned, but the first is the wave of voter suppression and sort of new ways that that's being done this year because of COVID. And second is social media, including micro-targeting of polarizing messages, both to mobilize and demobilize. All of you have mentioned the platforms to some extent. So postmortem coverage of 2016 examined those extensively, and there's maybe a little bit less of it now, potentially it's getting drowned out, but what do you make of these trends and how will they impact the election? Well, I, I know of no, uh, the, there's a lot of commentary about voter suppression in the same way there's a lot of commentary about voter fraud. Uh, there was one major study that showed there was some possibility of voter suppression, but Justin Grimmer in the political science department showed that that study was statistically meaningless. Uh, and I, I just in the same way, I don't think there are any studies that, uh, that show that there is any voter fraud. In fact, uh, yesterday, Benjamin Ginsburg, who has been for 20 years the Republicans' main lawyer on election law, uh, ben Ginsburg yesterday wrote in the Washington Post an editorial saying the Republicans have made no credible case that uh, there would be voter fraud uh, that, that would occur by uh, mail voting. So I, I, my view is the social science evidence on this is uh, there's no problem with mail voting and uh, there may be, there may be uh, uh, voter suppression, but mainly along the lines strikes me of not allowing uh, felons out of jail in Florida to vote, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think, um, it's, so I do think in 2016, this was really about uh, turnout, trying to depress turnout of some segments. Um, and, you know, and, and I, so I think that was generally the ball game in 16. 20, I think will be different. And uh, I mean, to, to Julia's point, like there's in places like Alabama in the special senatorial election, black voters overperformed their proportion of the electorate, despite Alabama having very strict voter ID laws. So I think grassroots organizations, especially this year, will mobilize uh, voters by teaching them what the restrictions are and then helping them get past those restrictions in enough time to, to have their vote count. But I think the disinformation is going to be more around election results and not keeping people home from the polls, but no matter how many people show up to vote, eroding people's faith in the reports about the election results. And that's the part I think will be a, we, we'll use the old, we'll use voter suppression, um, prop, like prop, we'll use some of the messaging around voter suppression about who voted and who didn't and why, and disinformation about who you can trust and who you can't, but not to keep people home or change their votes before the election, but to change the perception of the uh, election results. And that, I, I hope we're prepared for that. I know folks are thinking about it. Uh, in terms of fraud, fraud, very quickly, the Brennan Center has looked at this. The incidence of fraud is something like 0.0025%, which means the likelihood of a person voting twice is about the same as that person being hit by a meteor at some point in their lifetime. So voter fraud is not something that, that is an issue in our democracy, but uh, trusting uh, the, the election results, I think is going to be one we'll have to contend with this year. Julia? Yeah. Um, yeah, although, you know, I do remember at one point, weren't they saying there was a meteor headed toward us, but, you know, it didn't come. Um, the <laughs> On election day, I think, or the day before even. <laughs> right? Despite my best hopes, it hasn't arrived yet. Um, the, um, yeah, so I just want to underscore, um, I think, one of the things that, that David said, which is about the way that voter suppression is primarily structural, right, is primarily built into the system around ideas like felon disenfranchisement and, and the ways that 
voter both voter registration and also the kind of mechanisms of, of voting location of polling places and things like that are set up particularly in the south and in urban areas um, and that would be a better place for us to look for voter suppression the stories won't be as exciting um, or as you know dramatic but i think really really important what i actually want to want to touch on is the intersection between misinformation voter suppression and demob demobilization so in, in 2016, just to expand on what's already been said, some of the demobilization um, on social media, some of the stories were that these were really targeted at African-American voters with messages, for example, um, about Clinton's record in Haiti, um, micro-targeted on social media to um, Haitian communities in Miami, things like that to try and get people to stay home. I don't know if, I don't know if that will happen or be effective in 2020, maybe not. Um, but I also think that what's going on is there's so much noise and there's so much talk about the possibility of voter suppression and about the possibility the election won't be fought fairly in one way or another, uh, that one of my concerns, I've been talking a lot to my students about this, is that people's sense of the legitimacy of the process, will that will have a depressing effect on turnout. And I don't know for sure, I, I already, I realized I just said that when people feel like they're being disenfranchised, they might actually get mobilized. But, I, but I'm hearing the opposite argument as well. Um, and I think, I think we just don't know. And I do think that concern about, um, concern about electoral legitimacy, concern about election integrity is, um, is something we should be looking at for, for potential demobilizing impacts. Yeah, that's have, a, the, I wanna yeah, just add one thing. We, um, I think it was in Georgia. Um, so in work that we've done at the Brennan Center, along with a survey recently done, I think it was by Third Way, they focus grouped Black voters in, you know, battleground states and, and also places like Georgia. But what they found was in Georgia, um, all of the voter suppression happening there had a demoralizing effect on Black voters who just felt like no matter what I do, they're going to make sure my vote doesn't count. Whereas in Michigan, Black voters there were more uh, inspired to beat the system and go and make sure their vote counts. So even regionally, like different, it will, it, the efforts by the states will play different with their constituents based on where they are, their state's history, the, the demographics of the state. So I think that's, that's a great point that Julia brought out that, um, that it, it, just the talk of voter suppression may demoralize some folks, uh, especially in states like Georgia, who Democrats believe may, they may have a shot at, at pulling off uh, a win in, in, uh, you know, in November. Well, I, I do want to say that 2016, compared to Barack Obama, that turnout, black turnout in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin was lower than it had been. And, and my guess is that, that that won't happen again, because now you have Trump. Trump was kind of an unknown, and now he's not unknown. So, uh, so I agree. With, I, I agree with that. But I do think that uh, I do think turnout, uh, minority turnout, will be higher in this election, particularly in battleground states, than it was in 2016. So we have some more factual questions about um, the election day and the way ballots are counted. Before we'll pivot and talk about some other things, but. The first question is from Stephen Piper here at FSI. With regard to blue drift issues, like counting mail-in ballots and versus same day in-person voting, there are some states that allow early counting of mail-in ballots and some that hold off until after. Do you all have a sense of the distribution of those rules? And second question from Aaron Carter, one of our visiting scholars and a professor at USC. The last slide David showed on partisan differences on how people plan to vote was pretty concerning because we know that Trump will likely declare himself the winner any early possibility that he gets. So are there mechanisms to try to hold off either through how the news reports election results or how the candidates themselves discuss the election results that you think can mitigate the likelihood of that? Well, the teams that, um, the teams that do the, the exit polls and predict the winners are fully apprised of the difficulties they're facing. Second, there are uh, strong movements in the Democratic Party to uh, try and get people to do one of two things, either to vote in person rather than by mail or make sure that the ballot gets dropped off. The 
problem is that uh, the each state has very different. I'm just going to give you one example. Uh, Pennsylvania is a state, crucial state, and it's a state where uh, you you can't just ask for an absentee ballot. You have to have an excuse. So there's a bunch, there's a bunch of states where you, everybody gets a ballot, California, Oregon. Then there's states where it's easy to get one, but you have to ask for a mail-in ballot. But then there's states like Pennsylvania where you have to have an excuse. So they have a tradition, along with Michigan, of not having ever counted very many votes uh, by ballot. And so, uh, and the next thing is most of the people that count those ballots are older. Uh, they're, uh, they're people who tend to be uh, pick up a day, they're retired. And so uh, there is a whole bunch of stuff uh, going on in this. I would suggest if people are really interested in our DD suggestion, Bruce Kane, who here who heads the Center for the Study of the American West, uh, he's a real expert on that and knows it state by state, but it, it varies state by state. Uh, but, but there are some states, uh, key battleground states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, where they're not very familiar with counting votes, and that's where I see the problem coming. Julia or Ted? Now, I'm trying to pull up a link because I was I played a, a very small role in a, a larger commission, and there was a report um, that we had that was specifically about what should be done in um, about things like blue drift and in the in the event of a, a long. Um, Kind of election counting process, so I'm going to find that link and drop it um, in the Q and A if I can for the for the participants, so they can look at that report. Um, and I was also on a panel last week with with Rick Hassan, who headed up this report and who mm -hmm. knows all of these things. It was Bruce Kane was part of it also, and Ned Foley, who we've mentioned. And I know that Rick actually talked about the distribution on this panel last week of which states um, allow early counting and which don't. I know that um, I think he said Wisconsin doesn't, which was, which I should know because I live here. Um, but it, um, I'm totally drawing a blank on all of that, but I can draw, I can try to drop some links and, and help out on that. That'd be great, thanks. So we try to wrap up within an hour. In the final few minutes, I wanted to shift to talking about policy, which has been missing. Oh, sorry, Ted, did you want to jump in? No, it's, it's fine. We can okay. Move. Yeah. So the question is about policy. Obviously there are big crisis level issues that are dominating this campaign for good reason. But it's also been a little bit unclear what a Biden administration or a Trump's second term would do in terms of policy. I'm wondering if any voters um, seem to care about what the policy issues are, um, and if they should, if that should even be salient this in 2020. And second of all, if they do care, what have the candidates said about what their policy priorities would be? Um, that's uh, that's a very interesting question. Policy, because because of the nature of Trump, it's sort of been more about him, and then he wants to put the pressure on Biden as being too left. So I do think the main policy dimensions, Didi, are this: uh, how far left, how far right. But it does seem clear that given what Biden's put forward, that there will be uh, more uh, more more regulation, more more taxes. Uh, there will, in fact, then uh, be more infrastructure built. And so I think that that dimension seems clear. But when we uh, hit people up in focus groups and stuff, they kind of have that in the back of their mind that they know it'll be more like this, but uh, they don't, they don't, uh, it, it's hard to keep them going on that. They all want, they, then they want to go back to talking about Trump or talking about Biden. Okay. Ted? Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think policy should matter. And I would love for the presidential debates coming up to be as substantive as some of the Democratic primary debates where I don't have much faith that that's actually going to be the case. <laughs> I think most Americans also understand that even if they get the president they want, um, they, they probably are not going to get the congressional configuration that they want also. And so to the extent major policy transformation can happen or big policy moves will take place and be passed and implemented um, in statute is, is uh, you know, th those odds are slim. So I, I do think this is more about, I think COVID is going to play a large role in this. And in a time when, in a time of crisis, 
who do we trust more to lead the nation through the crisis and to not uh, cause the nation to emerge from the crisis more divided than we entered it. And I think this is the case that Biden is trying to make uh, for his, himself and his campaign. And that touches a number of policy issues. I mean, this, it could be, it has national security implications, economy implications, public health implications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think it's more a referenda on, on leadership and sort of uh, faith in a, a person's leadership abilities instead of a specific technocratic assessments of uh, different policies. Thanks. Julia. Yeah, um, I, I wanna kind of build on that because I think it's an important distinction between the kind of retrospective voting that's that seems to be being encouraged at the presidential level, but also we have all these congressional elections happening. And I think this prospective framework might be something that we'll see, I don't, I don't happen to be in a place with a competitive with any Senate race, um, but I think in places where the Senate race is competitive, in North Carolina, in Arizona, um, in Colorado, in Maine, that where you have uh, Republican incumbents in states that are moving away from the Republican Party in particular, that you might start hearing these more prospective frameworks of if you are a person who's voting for Biden and you want to see stuff get done, then you also need to think about this this Senate race. I think that's a, the kind of appeal that you might um, that you might start hearing. I think the Democratic Party, in the course of those primaries, came up with a lot of different policy ideas um, that may not that you know that may not fully unify the party when we start looking at the details. And I think it'll be really interesting to see who the energy is behind a potential new, even if it's very ephemeral Democratic majority if that happens um who are you know who are the key interest groups who are the key social movements that are shaping the agenda of um of this new potential government in washington um and I, i've written a little bit about that so i can drop some self-promotional links in the chat because i never met a self-promotion opportunity i didn't like well those are informative opportunities um the the final question david did you want to jump in I did want to say, Didi, in the slides I gave you, the last slide, which I didn't show, which you can pass on to whoever wants, shows the number of states uh, by, and by party who, uh, who are voting by uh, mail ballot only uh, with an excuse and with not, and you're free to pass that on. Okay, great. Thank you. The final question is, um, what is the one thing you would recommend that an, a sort of average citizen can do between now and the election, aside from try to figure out their own complex uh, voting rules. Turn off the TV, don't watch <laughs> CNN, don't want Fox, blow up Facebook and go and vote. Okay. Yeah, I would encourage patience. Uh, do not expect to wake up Wednesday morning and know the result of the election <laughs> and expect for it to be settled president-elect or president, you know, whatever, uh, and then you can go about your life. Uh, expect for this to drag on maybe into Thanksgiving or beyond. Uh, and so condition yourself to, um, to, to be patient uh, in waiting for election results. You're, you're not hoping for that, right? You're just that's I am not. Great. I would love to wake up Wednesday morning and have this thing settled. Yes. For sure. Seriously. Right. We're on the same page. <laughs> Julia? Um, yeah, all of that. I have... I think a piece of advice that's not super specific to the to the moment we're in now, um, which I think is also in hopes that someday there will be a different moment um, that we'll be in. And that is to, to think about conversations with people who share your party affiliation, but don't necessarily share everything about your background or your ideas or your beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and think about, you know, I used to say, do this in person, go to a party meeting. Obviously that's all gone now. Um, but Whatever kinds of formats there might be, I know there's, you know, various political groups and where I live are having virtual meetings. Um, but really, you know, we hear a lot about talking across the aisle, and I think that's that's really important. But it's a very heavy lift right now for folks of various ideologies. But think about how you might how you might have an actual conversation with someone who shares your overarching goals, um, and how you might come to an agreement on you know, if you're both Democrats on something like the Green New Deal, if you see that differently, if you're both Republicans on this, the question of immigration or the question of gun control, whatever, whatever it is, um, get, get into these disagreements within your own party. Thank you. Those were all really wonderful pieces of advice. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and your insights today. 
We will have a panel on Thursday after the election. So that's two days after. I really don't expect that there will necessarily be a decisive thing to talk about, but we hope to see some of you audience members in the future. Obviously the panelists, we will keep an eye out on everything you're writing and saying about the election. And thanks everyone for being here today. Thank Stay you. Safe.